Good afternoon. Welcome to the Vermont Legislature's House Committee on Environment and Energy. This afternoon, we're going to um, we're going to take up S five again, and we're going to hear from the Department of Public Service. Um, though um, about, we're going to learn about the Renewable Energy Standard. Um, is it? Yeah. Great. Well, thank you uh, for having us back again. Um, and uh, for the record, TJ Poor, Director of Planning at the Department of Public Service. Hi, uh, and do you want to introduce yourself now? Yeah, Melissa <laughs> Bailey, Director of Efficiency and Energy Resources at the Department of Public Service. So we just have a, a few slides here for like an overview of the renewable energy standard, really high level structural things. Um, and then uh, we're happy to take this wherever um, wherever you want to take it with questions and how kind of the implementation happens or just like the verification, et cetera, whatever, whatever you want to talk about, we're here to answer questions for you. And um, so I'll just start really quickly with. Representative Sibelia. Yeah. Uh, I thought this testimony would be helpful in terms of um, we have a, we have one other uh, type of energy standard in statute. Uh, there are obligated parties. Uh, there's a program that is evaluated and supervised. So they are not one-to-one -one comparisons, but just conceptually, I thought it might be helpful just to think about, uh, understand a little bit more how this different but similar type of program. Right. And just to give you a sense in the division of responsibilities of the department, uh, as the director of planning, uh, the planning division does a lot of work on the wholesale side and the power supply. So that's tier one and two of the renewable energy standard dealing with how our electricity supply is supplied. Um, tier three is we'll get into the energy transformation tier and is more the retail side services to customers, reductions of fossil fuels. And that's Melissa's team, um, efficiency and energy resources, uh, really works on that, which is why both of us are here today. I can't seem to advance my uh, So just really quickly, the Renewable Energy Standard uh, is an obligation on Vermont's electric distribution utilities. That's who's obligated by it. There's 17 electric distribution utilities in the state. Um, so that's the number of reporting, uh, possible reporting entities, although smaller uh, utilities can combine and report as one under VIPSA. So Vermont Public Power Supply Authority supports for uh, 11 of the smaller municipal utilities. Hyde Park and Stowe uh, report on their own. Burlington Electric reports on their own. All of the co-ops and Fremont Power Report. Um, there's three tiers to uh, the Renewable Energy Standard. And uh, I'll talk really briefly about tiers one and two. One is that total renewable energy requirement, how much as a percent of your retail sales, are you required to have as renewable energy as defined by statute? Tier two is how much of that is uh, small local generation uh, under five megawatts and, and located in Vermont. And tiers one and two are uh, the compliance is uh, shown uh, towards the obligation by the retirement of renewable energy certificates or renewable energy credits. Um, so just really quickly, both of the both of the tiers one and two have, um, have statute is set up. It outlines the purpose of it, describes that eligibility, which resources can be entered into the state, um, the required amounts. I won't go over those in detail here. I've done that another time. Um, the statute has exemptions um, to tier one, so you know. For example, the, we talked a little earlier today, but the commission could, has the opportunity to reduce uh, a utility's obligation if findings are made for good cause. And each of the tiers has an alternative compliance payment. And so that's the, um, the maximum that a utility will pay uh, for a resource to meet its requirement. Otherwise, um, you know, if they, they were to pay above that, those actually likely wouldn't be recoverable in rates. So the alternative compliance payment just sets a cap on what utilities can pay to meet the obligation. And what the legislature has said is an acceptable 
uh, acceptable amount to pay for, for the purpose. Uh, for the tier one's case, that purpose is to encourage economic and environmental benefits of renewable energy. And then in tier two's case, it's specifically to encourage distributed generation disability to avoid T and D constraints and diversify resources connected in Vermont. And so clearly outlined purpose and um, compliance is, is met by those renewable energy certificates. Um, that's really the high level overview that I wanted to give for tiers one and two, and we will kind of let you guide what you wanted to know in detail. We could go on to tier three first, or we could just to whatever you please. Um, I'd, I'd like to learn more about renewable energy certificates and how you manage, you, I'm assuming you manage those and how does uh, how do they work? So yeah, sure. So a renewable energy certificate is, well, I'll back up. Every time a megawatt hour is generated, no matter if it's a renewable resource or, or not, uh, it has an environmental attribute associated with it that's tracked. And the renewable ones are called renewable energy certificates. And renewability is defined differently in each state in New England. Um, and Vermont's definition is in 30 VSA 8002. It says what's renewable, what's not. Um, and uh, so each... Each time you generate a megawatt hour, it has an associated um, renewable energy attribute or a renewable energy credit. Now, when a generator gets cited or even when the renewable energy standard was first established, a generator had to apply to the Public Utility Commission to get uh, its generation or its uh, facility certified by the commission as a resource, as a eligible resource to meet the renewable energy standard. And that was either for tier one or for tier two. Um, once it's certified, um, you know, the generation, each megawatt hour generated um, kind of goes into the New England grid, right? And so ISO New England uh, and the regional grid operator operates something called the generator information system. It's, uh, and this is a database that tracks every attribute in New England that is generated or imported into New England. And so that, um, that database uh, is, is kind of the tracking me mechanism for <clears throat> compliance. And what happens is every year after, you know, after the year closes, the, uh, and oh, let me back up. So Sorry, I'm just trying to get to the best order to, to explain this. But uh, so after the year closes, each utility files a compliance report with the uh, uh, Department of Public Service. And what they do is from that gen uh, generator information system uh, managed by ISO New England, they provide reports that show that each um, megawatt hour that is in that system that they either retired those or that they have the rights for those megawatt hours in order to, um, to claim that that was renewable energy that they had. So it's all the compliance for tier, the renewable energy standards here one and two is all based on this tracking system and renewable energy credits. It actually doesn't matter what they, the energy that they purchase. Um, renewable energy credits can be purchased with the actual electricity, or they can be unbundled, we call it, and purchased separate from that, uh, se separate from that electricity. And so really we're just, in terms of compliance, looking at those recs. Um, once we get that, we verify that it, uh, they have the right amount compared to their obligation. And we um, submit a report to the Public Utility Commission uh, that is ultimately the decider upon whether the uh, utility has met their obligation or not. If they don't meet their, <laughs> hadn't met their obligation, uh, then they have to um, pay the alternative compliance payment um, for every megawatt hour they don't meet, they pay that to the clean energy development. <laughs> that has, uh, Never really happened. It happened once. There was like a data error, and there was one renewable energy credit that was needed. So the Clean Energy Development Fund got a check for ten dollars um, because that was the alternative compliance payment at the time. Um, so 
that hasn't happened because the utilities, um, it's been more affordable than the alternative compliance payment to actually just go get the renewable energy credits. So they instead they they purchase those credits. Who is this? Really long winded. No, that, that was very helpful. Is a one rec? Is it static and it's linked to like I put in a solar field and it's generated one megawatt, and it's that's one rec for that one solar field that's done. Uh, it's one rec for each megawatt hour generated from the uh, from the facility. So, so it keeps accruing as this energy is generated. Correct. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> you have questions on the tier one and tier two. Um, so the other bit of information I should share is that tracking system is is pretty complex. All the states use it. So um, and. It says, you know, where each resource is eligible. So a solar generator, for instance, that's located in Vermont might actually be eligible for um, to be used for compliance in uh, in Massachusetts, for example. And so it's not <clears throat> bound by Vermont borders. That tracking system, um, because it's complicated and cover it, uh, it deals with a lot of different compliance entities. Uh, it's about a million dollars uh, per year to run that. Uh, that's shared through by all, all six states. So the one pays a slow ratio share of that, about you know, four or five percent, depending on how it's calculated. And um, so what we're paying for that system, but it's it's not a um, it's not just like a, a workbook that manages it, like an Excel sheet. It's really a complicated system, but it is, it's important because it ensures that um, two different entities aren't counting um, the, same, uh, the same resource. And it ensures that um, you know, utilities are actually, or, or it's the vehicle by which we can ensure that our utilities are actually meeting their obligation. So what does it mean to retire a wreck? Yeah, that's a, a good question. So uh, if you're retiring a rec, you're kind of taking it out of circulation. Uh, and by doing so, you're retiring it uh, for like a utility would generally retire it in order to meet its obligation. But once you click that box in the in the tracking system, um, then it can no longer ever be used again. Um, it's used that once it's retired for now, year 2022, and um, it can't be used again that megawatt hour. And so it's retired from the marketplace. Now, other entities can also retire renewable energy credits, like a private company may have um, their, own, uh, their own company goals or um, uh, in, in, in service of those goals, they may want to they may want to retire renewable energy credits in order to show their own compliance. So they can either have a utility do it on their behalf or they themselves can say, I own this megawatt hour of uh, this rec and I would like to retire it in the system. And it then is taken out of you know, the, it, the marketplace so that other, other entities, utilities can't use it for compliance with their, with their own obligation. So essentially, if if I was um, you know my own company and I wanted to retire a, a rec um, in Vermont, then the state by its tracking would be you know whatever um, renewability is required by the utilities, whatever the utilities have required plus one uh, plus what I've retired, and that's how much renewable energy the state can actually claim. And do you, can you retire it annually? I. Uh, yeah, so usually the compliance years are, are based um, by the calendar year. Um, the market works quarterly, so you have kind of options to do it quarterly, but uh, the compliance years are usually annual. So can you talk a little bit about the effect of the renewable energy standard on um, the grid and carbon? Uh, sure. So um, where to start? Um, well, <laughs> so the renewable energy standard was intended to reduce our fossil fuel um, 
uh, use uh, for electricity? Uh, in, in part, uh, and I, I'm actually not sure that that was, if that was one of the goals. Increase renewable energy. Um, so I think it is to, so it had a number of goals associated with the renewable energy standard, but when the renewable energy standard came into effect in, it was passed in 2015, started in 2017, Vermont did not have a uh, obligations of their utilities to be renewable. And so we have our power supply resources that largely, you know, those contracts for electricity were being um, entered into by our utilities. And they were, um, some of them were renewable, some of them, you know, there's contracts with the nuclear plant in New Hampshire, um, there's a biomass plant, sometimes they own plants, and the utilities would enter into those and then often sell the renewable energy credits associated with them for into other states' markets in order to reduce rate pressure. And so when, when you sell that, um, the right to call something renewable, um, then you can no longer say you have renewable energy. And so that power was, um, you know, Connecticut, for example, could claim that they had biomass wrecks because um, the wrecks from McNeil were sold in Connecticut. And so what, what the resulting mix is when you sell the, the attributes that you have, you're assumed to have kind of what's called the ISO residual mix. And so that's the ISO New England, the grid operator, the... Um, the remainder of all the attributes that nobody has claimed, and there's an average emissions profile of that. And that's kind of dirty. It's uh, mostly natural gas, and uh, but there is nuclear in there, there is hydro in there, and there's some other renewable resources. But it, um, you know, when, when those renewable energy credits were sold out of state, you know, the mix uh, essentially was now um, replaced by or that those megawatt hours as we count like towards the greenhouse gas inventory is replaced by the ISO New England mix. And so, um, so yes, in that instance, in, this, in that case, when we had the renewable energy standard, we said utilities, you have to keep your renewable attributes and that renewability going to replace, replace that residual mix, um, which, was, which was dirtier. <laughs> I wish there was an easier answer to that question. <laughs> okay, so uh, we'll move on to tier three for now. Oops. Um, yeah, so as, as teacher mentioned, renewable energy standard was passed in 2015, took effect in 2017. Um, tier three was significantly different from the other two tiers. Uh, we call it the energy transformation tier. And it really was a policy aimed at spurring um, activity in the transportation and thermal sectors, uh, recognizing that Vermont had a longstanding um, successful programs in the electric sector to increase renewability and to promote efficiency. Um, we had a pretty clean electric supply and we had made significant investments in efficiency, but there was this gap where um, the transportation and thermal sectors um, we're still largely fossil fuel driven. I think that's still the case today. Um, but tier three was one um, kind of step foray into those um, sectors. And again, it's, it's aimed at reducing fossil fuel consumption. The obligated entities are still the electric distribution utilities. So the same 17 um, entities that are obligated under tiers one and two. Um, the, um, the only caveat is that Tier three can be satisfied by doing more tier two. So tier two is small scale renewable development in state. The utilities can opt to do more of that and not do these fossil fuel reduction um, projects and programs if they want or if they find that more cost effective for their individual utility. I think we only have one utility right now that's not doing tier three programs. Um, so, and the obligations are set as um, megawatt hour equivalent. Um, so they're expressed as a percentage of retail sales, just the way tiers one and tiers two are. Um, but really the, the basis of these credits, these tier three credits are um, MMBTU, so reduction in energy use. So it's fossil fuel converted to MMBTU and then there's this conversion to megawatt hours, but that's really just so that you can express the obligation as a percent of an electric company's sales. It's just um, putting 
um, the unit of measurement into what electric utilities are used to. Um, and I think a, a, an important point on the obligation is it, um, the tier three obligation wasn't um, tied to meeting any specific, specific amount of energy savings or any specific energy goal. So um, tier three started at 2% of retail sales and ramps up to 12% of retail sales um, by 2032. But again, it wasn't aimed at um, meeting the GWSA or any other kind of set policy goal. So it's different um, than what's envisioned under the clean heat standards, also different than what's envisioned or than our current practice within the energy efficiency world, where we go out to a fire all cost effective efficiency. Um, so this one, I don't want to use the word arbitrary, but um, I think for lack of a better word, it's, a, it's kind of an arbitrary target um, for tier three credits. Um, Let's see what else. I was just a couple more points on here. Um, utilities are required to do cost effectiveness screening. They need to do that either in their integrated resource plans, which they do every three years, or through their tier three plans, which they present to um, the Public Utility Commission every year. Uh, the statute, tier three statute, um, requires incremental investment. So utilities can only take credit for projects that wouldn't have happened otherwise under existing programs like the weatherization programs or efficiency Vermont's programs. Um, so it's an incremental program. Um, there is an alternative compliance com payment, which sets the cap for how much utilities can spend on their tier three programs that started at $60 a megawatt hour and has been adjusted up upwards by the consumer price index. Um, and I realized I didn't have a bullet on the tag, but the technical advisory group um, for tier three is the, is the group um, that sets the savings amounts for each measure under tier three. <clears throat> we can talk a little bit about more about tier three measures, but um, it's pretty broad policy, really. Any fossil fuel production um, technology can be an eligible tier three measure. And so that can be anything from converting from a um, gas powered lawnmower to an electric lawnmower to you know replacing a diesel generator with um, electric use for, for a, a more commercial application. Uh, sure, yeah, question. Representative Tory. Um, what kind of staff time does it take to monitor this? That's a good question. And I can follow up with a concrete estimate, but I can, Try and think it through on the fly. So, um, because tier three looked more like an efficiency program than than something in the power supply world, which is uh, what TJ's team manages, um, it sits with with my team, which is the division of efficiency and energy resources. Um, we're a staff of six, but I would say the bulk of our staff resources are on the efficiency utility side. So, efficiency Vermont. Um, we do have two technical staff that are responsible for measurement and verification. Um, but we do have some quantification of, of their labor hours for doing verification related specifically to tier three. I probably not want to okay. enter it on the fly. Um, and then there's the policy component and there's some legal components. So we do have pretty good estimates of those that we developed um, to inform the S5 consideration. Um, I will say the, well, I think I'm going to touch on this next, but the tracking for tier three. We don't have a GIS for tier three. Tier three is one of those areas in which Vermont is weak. Um, other states in the region do not have this um, fossil fuel requirement sitting on electric utilities. So this is all spreadsheet based tracking. Um, and again, it's the same 17 entities that have the obligation, but 11 of those comply in aggregate through Vermont Public Power Supply Authority. So you really do have um, six or seven um, obligations. And it is, they, they submit a spreadsheet every year. And um, we would compare those to the previous year's spreadsheet, make sure that the credits that they were carrying over year to year tie out. Um, but we do not have a tracking system the way tiers one and two do. Representative Sibelia. Melissa, I just want to double check. Um, I think I heard you say there are no other states that have um, a, this type of a thermal burden on their electric utilities. This uh, would require requirement to reduce fossil fuel usage. Right. At the time, tier three was implemented, I believe we were the first. I cannot say confidently that there aren't any other similar obligations now. Um, tier three, I mean, in essence, tier three 
has largely been in implementation. It's largely been focused on electrification. So um, electric utilities encouraging their customers to adopt technologies that use more electricity like electric vehicles. And so that's why I'm pausing. I think other states may have other activities where the electric utilities um, invest in those electrification technologies. Actually, um, tier three. So can you tell us just a little bit more um, about the tier three and how that is being fulfilled? I'm hearing you say electric cars. Is that the predominant way that that's being fulfilled? Yeah, we have a chart here. Great. Yeah, no, heat pumps is predominantly the, the compliance mechanism. Great. EVs are the second largest um, component. And so structurally and you know, statutorily, any fossil fuel reduction activity largely is eligible. So you could think weatherization is eligible. Um, converting to, you know, biomass heating, wood heating, those are all eligible under tier three because they're they're reducing fossil fuel usage. To, for the most part, the utilities look at, they compare, um, so when the utilities build their programs, they typically are focused on electrification because they're looking at the ability then to generate more revenue through those added sales. So if a utility is looking at, um, for an individual customer, do I incentivize putting in a wood stove or do I incentivize putting in a heat pump? From the utility ratepayer perspective, it's more advantageous typically to incentivize that heat pump because they will then be able to collect additional revenue by the um, electricity they're selling to power the heat pump. So, so most many utilities design their tier three programs to be essentially cost neutral so that it's not an expenditure of funds or it is an expenditure of funds up front and they recover that revenue. Whereas if they were investing in things like wood stoves or weatherization, it would be money out of the utility and they wouldn't ever recover that back is why yeah. we see electrification dominating compliance. So how is the, like, how are you assigning them their requirements in this tier three? So that's the piece that I said was a bit arbitrary when the statute was, it's a megawatt hour equivalent um, it's a percentage of the retail sales. So every utility has a certain annual sales expressed in megawatt hours. Um, for tiers one and two, they have to have a certain percentage of those megawatt hours from renewable sources. Tier three also has a requirement expressed as starting at 2% of their retail sales, ramping up to 12% of the retail sales equivalent savings through tier three. Um, I know it's a little bit complicated, but essentially, what the tag does is to look at um, the net fuel savings that you get, which is like gallons of, say, oil, for instance. They convert that to MMBTU, which is just the universal uh, measurement for energy. And then at the very end of the day, they do a conversion to megawatt hours. So what, what does that MMBTU, what does that amount of energy equate to in terms of megawatt hours? And that's really just to put it in the units that the utilities are conversant. <clears throat> and so you say it ramps up from two to 12% ramps up over what, what metric time or? Yeah, so, so sorry, the initial um, obligation year was 2017 for most utilities. Some utilities got a delay until 2019 and that requirement ramps up until 2032. And then it's just held steady at 12% of retail sales. Year over year though. I mean, do they have to each keep so if, doing it? So every they have to do 12% of this kind of work. 12% of the retail sales, they have to invest that into electrification or getting people off fossil fuels. Essentially, they have to acquire the equivalent of 12% of their sales in fossil fuel reductions. Okay. That's just a flat obligation going out in perpetuity currently in, in statute. Okay. Once we hit 2032. They'll be so as your as your sales. If your sales are increasing, you have to do more, require more tier three savings over time. Interesting, because if your electricity is renewable and green, I mean that's sort of. I mean, are you getting at? There may not be potential if we come to a completely renewable future. There may not be enough potential to reduce fossil fuel well there well there's that but also yeah anyway thank uh, representative tory thank you um i'm just wondering as technologies emerge you know we're piloting integrated controls right now 
Did that become an eligible to? How do, how do measures get added? Yeah, so um, under the tag process, typically a utility um, would come forward and say, this is a measure I'm interested in offering. Um, I think there is a pathway where if a utility doesn't sponsor a measure, they can come to uh, the public service department and say, look, this is a promising technology. Um, so the utilities are all participants in TAG, as is the Department of Public Service um, and the efficiency utilities. And what happens in 2032? We just keep going at 12%? Yes. So they say, we've done everything we can do. It's yeah, I suppose that would be a good problem to have. But yes, right now the, the um, obligation flattens out in 2032 and they would continue to acquire fossil fuel reductions tied to the percent of their sales. And there is an accounting for, um, in the energy savings, there is an accounting to your question about, um, you know, our fuel supply is, our electric supply is getting more and more renewable. So um, that's accounted for in calculating the fossil fuel savings from each measure. So um, if I have, if I'm, if, if I'm served by a utility that has a power supply that relies heavily on fossil fuels, um, my changing over to say a heat pump won't be considered 100% green or 100% renewable. It'll only be considered renewable up to the portion of my utilities portfolio that's served by renewable resources. So there are utilities in the state, um, Burlington Electric Department, Swanton Electric, and Washington Electric Co-op that have 100% renewable power supply. So if I replace my, my car, my gas burning car with an electric vehicle, that's considered a complete offset of, of fossil fuel usage um, because it's assumed that I'm no longer using any fossil fuel to power my vehicle. But if I'm a customer of a utility that has, say, 75% renewable portfolio, 25% of the um, electricity used to power the car then is still reliant on fossil fuels. So that's all accounted for in the measure characterization. And I hope that makes sense. And the tag does the message characterization? The tag does the measure characterization. Pretty much the exclusive function of tag right now is, is quantifying the fossil fuel reductions. Um, <laughs> so I should, all right, all right, I'll just make a note, my friend here, um, that, and under tier three, you do, utilities do claim the lifetime savings of the measure in the first year, in the year that they um, offer the program or offer the rebate. So they're paying out a rebate for an electric vehicle and they're able to claim the fossil fuel savings that will accrue over the whole 12 year life of that vehicle. So they're not, um, it's not an annual claim, which again is um, different than the structure envisioned under S5 and the Affordable Heat Act, where um, I think the utility, or the, I'm sorry, the obligated parties would be claiming those savings each year throughout the measure life. So it's a structural difference there. Then if Sebelia. Yes, so when we think about an unregulated, largely unregulated, um, sales component of our fossil fuels. Um, and you look at uh, this lifetime savings all at once or spread out over. Is there either um, either of those uh, more suited for a, tran a transition we're envisioning here? In terms of whether you claim the savings upfront versus year over year, um, I think the complexity in tracking is simplified if you claim it up front. Um, and that's for, I think, two reasons. One being consistency with tier three, because we're talking about a policy that would basically be an umbrella that sits over tier three. Um, so having consistency there so that it, your, if a utility is claiming a tier three credit all up front, um, having consistency with how the other obligated entities claim their credit um, simplifies that. And it, I think, alleviates some of the burden on the obligated entities for tracking credits year over year. Again, I'm, it's unclear whether this would be done through spreadsheets or through another more complicated tracking system, um, the GIS system that TJ spent a lot of time discussing, right? Utilities or uh, obligated parties have kind of a bank of credits and they're able to draw from that bank and retire them. Um, I think that that process would be simplified, again, if they were claiming those credits up front. And then, of course, the 
the PUC would have to set the obligations knowing that all of those savings didn't really accrue in that first year. So potentially you'd be looking at higher obligations on the obligated parties. Right. And so having that uh, spread out is a lower uh, burden, uh, potentially a lower burden on the obligated parties over time. Not necessarily, I think, because they'd be paying for the measure mm -hmm. up front. So if you're paying for a weatherization job and you're paying for the entire amount in that first year, to some extent tying the credit to the year, to the payment might help them and might avoid the, um, the incentive for them to pay for measures that are potentially like cheaper, but just one time measures or shorter term measures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But having them go out over time keeps their uh, obligation for doing new work lower than it would if they did it in the first year. I think it keeps the obligation lower, but I'm not sure that it keeps the cost lower. Got it. You could have a bigger obligation than um, credits that were potentially lower cost. Any further questions? So that was um, the, the high level on kind of the, how the renewable energy standard structure is. I, there's you know thousands of different details. Um, you know the the commission implemented it um, through. First, through an order and then did a rulemaking um, uh, for the renewable energy standard. Um, and there was, you know, a lot of open public, well, there's a lot of public com utility commission process where um, the, the opportunity to participate theoretically is there. And you know, different people have different opinions on how accessible that process is, but there, there was kind of this process as um, the PUC was designing the details of the renewable energy standard, there was time to kind of, um, within the parameters of the statute, um, shift um, and make some decisions on how things might play out. Like the need for annual plans, for instance, and um, that Melissa mentioned or exactly how the, uh, might work or how the TAG uh, technical advisory group might approve measures, those, those types of things uh, all worked out. I think there was a proceeding uh, on, you know, energy storage is included as a tier three measure, for instance, that comes to mind. Um, so that kind of crosses the wholesale and retail side, that, that technology, but it uh, um, that went through a process and became, um, became eligible. Um, questions about how Hydro Quebec renewable energy credits would be treated, or New York Power Authority X would be treated. Um, so there was space in that process to kind of take input and and make decisions. Were either of you involved in that process? Yes, um, I was. Um, we we both historically were at Vermont Public Power Supply Authority. Um, they, and participated in that process um, there. <clears throat> there was some of that process when I came back to the department that I was still involved in the tail end of that process. Was there resistance to implementing the rest when it was proposed? I think, sure, yeah. Um, yeah, again, so I was sitting in a utility seat at the time at Vermont Public Power Supply Authority. I believe when the res was passed, it was passed with support of at least the majority of the utilities. Um, there's some background. I think tier three was largely seen as a way because of, as I spoke before about electrification, bringing additional revenue to utilities. It, it was largely seen that that um, added revenue could potentially offset the costs of complying with tiers one and two. And, and that was, I think, a key component of the package of having three tiers. Um, tiers one and tiers two are seen as having incremental cost, right? The renewability doesn't come um, for free. So um, I think taken as a package, tiers one, two, and three, my recollection is that there was wide support among the utilities, if not 
universal support. There, there was another issue on tiers one and two as well that where um, other states were um, making noises about, hey, Vermont doesn't actually have a renewable portfolio standard and we're actually paying for their projects. And, um, and so I think implementing that structure was supported because of that. They were, I think, for instance, um, there was a threat that the renewable energy credits from McNeil would actually not no longer be counted in um, in Connecticut, which would have been a um, a significant burden on the a rate burden on the owners of McNeil. And so there was there was a whole lot of moving pieces there, um, in in order to um, get. But ultimately, and Melissa's right, it, it generally had support. Representative Stebbins. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, uh, I guess I'd, uh, I'm trying to phrase this as a question as someone who actually sat on the Senate floor while it was debated. Um, how about outside of the utilities? Were there concerns from legislators about this blowing up people's um, electricity costs, costs? Do you remember that? And I'm sorry, that is a leading question. Because you remember it. I remember it. <laughs> Painfully. I've just had some thoughts. Yeah. Um, I don't. Well, we can both share our perspectives. Um, I don't. I do recall that there was discussion around cost. And I think this was a proposal largely supported by the Department of Public Service. And they came in with rate estimates of, of what the impacts would be. And again, that balancing between um, tiers three, tier three offsetting the costs of tiers one and two. So I remember that there was discussion of cost and that, and that there were numbers and assumptions that were, you know, kind of openly discussed and debated. Um, I don't remember concerns at the level of it's going to blow up electric bills or it's completely unsustainable, but I'm not. That those may have been aired as well. And I, I do think that there was a, a little... Um, a little more confidence in the estimates of, uh, well, there were estimates, as Melissa said, of what it would cost, and there was uh, confidence in those estimates because there were renewable portfolio markets, at least for tiers one and two, I'll speak to, um, that they, um, you know, other states have been trading these renewable energy credits, and they had a general sense of what those would cost in Vermont as well. Um, and then, of course, there was an alternative compliance payment that said, hey, if it costs more than this, then it well, it won't cost more than this because this is the most, you know, that alternative compliance payment is the cap. And so, um, Thanks. yeah. Representative Sebelia. Yeah, so with our utilities, we regulate the price also, um, the, their rate prices, which is not actually an equivalent. Um, with what is mentioned standard. So, um, yeah, our utilities are very used to being regulated. Um, and I guess my, my point was capping the price. I mean, we, we are managing the price overall. We're still not going to be managing the price overall here. We're allowing market forces to drive prices down. Um, that's what's envisioned here, uh, as opposed to the renewable energy standard, where we do have regulated entities and we can really manage and manufacture that price. Well, we we can help manage yes. price in terms of prudency of their investments and kind of their how they those investments translate into rates, but if costs are reasonably incurred, we it's not like we can say no, you you only charge. Um, seven cents a kilowatt hour because we think that's what electricity would cost. They get a re they can are allowed to bill at our reasonable rates. So but you take a lot of we take a lot of information about our utilities, um, which allows us to have a, a much better sense of what their costs, what, what the necessary costs are, which right. is not what's envisioned. Yes, as part of this we wouldn't have that level of insight. I think into. Right, we do not have that level of insight into the unregulated entities. Or... Representative Smith. Thank you. I think that Hydro Quebec could supply all of Vermont's power needs. Uh, theoretically, um, 
yeah, if if we had the import lines into Vermont, um, then it could theoretically be possible. They have enough supply. Um, it, you know, so yes, I, I'm not sure that that would be a great idea. Um, would it be the least expensive? Not necessarily. Um, it it depends on a lot of factors. You know, um, we have embedded contracts that we've signed with Hydro Quebec that um, go out for a number of years. Um, but they, um, Hydro Quebec now wants to um, sell into the regional marketplace, and so they want to get paid what the market will offer. Um, and so, if you're going to enter into a long-term contract with them, you're kind of evaluating that based on the market price, and then they need to evaluate. Well, if I'm entering a contract with Vermont, we can get long-term certainty over that price, and you know, there's trade-offs in that kind of contract negotiation, but wouldn't be able to say for certain that it would be higher or lower price um, than other resources. Thank you so much for coming in, not once, but twice today. <laughs> Thank Thanks you. for having us. All right, members, I'd like to take a five minute break. So we are gonna continue our shift to a discussion of S5. And we have with us our legislative counsel, Ellen Tykowski. And so we have um, taken a considerable amount of testimony to the bill and we finished the walkthrough. And I think it would be, if members have questions about the bill or about uh, testimony that you've heard suggested edits that we've gotten along the way this week, now would be a great time to bring them up. <clears throat> have we gotten the language from Efficiency Vermont? Yeah. No. Um, we got that yesterday. Yes. Yeah. So we've got a walkthrough of their suggestions, but I don't know if we have the language. Okay. Um, PC brought language yesterday, but I think Efficiency Vermont still needs to send us there. Okay. Okay. Then you copy Kate. So maybe it, who, who sent it? Dave Westman. Dave Westman, did you get that, Kate? We're checking on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I know that, thank you. I know a bunch of us got an email um, from a constituent in Burlington um, about the carbon intensity of biomass mm. um, and not including solid fuels in um, carbon intensity scale. I've been asking around, by learning more about that, whether or not it should be a concern, whether it made sense to insert a solid liquid or gaseous um, clean heat measure into that section, which is on page 22, carbon intensity of fuels. And I'm persuaded that we don't need to be concerned about it because the, <clears throat> the, I mean, we still need to meet our emissions reductions goals on an annual basis and technical advisors suggest that the scalability of biomass is such that it isn't the same level of threat as liquid and gas heat measures. So I don't know if anybody else is wondering about that email thread. Um, I, I, I actually just had a conversation with, with Representative uh, with Representative um, Elden that uh, I would like to have some testimony in here from people uh, who have knowledge about, about biomass. Um, and I have, I will be making some suggestions about that, but um, uh, there, there, I think for purposes of thermal energy, as opposed to electric generation, which is a separate, a separate subject, um, I do think there's a very important uh, place for it, act, actually, in terms of uh, it, what's now called advanced uh, 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 wood, wood heating pellets uh, uh, in, in, in particular. So um, uh, I, I think uh, there are, and, and we, we have heard, uh, you know, about th that, th that uh, 
um, uh, heat pumps have, at least in current technology, have to limit cer certain limitations in terms of, you know, uh, 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 they're, they're not for every, they're not for every situation. So I, I, I'm having dealt with this issue in, in the previous committee that that uh, that I served on and all of that, I'm I'm pretty convinced that that that, that it is um, uh, an impo important option that probably should have a little bit more um, mention uh, in, in 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 the bill, uh, and and that we should inform ourselves a little bit more of, of, about that. Uh, and, and I'll just say in terms of. Uh, uh, Biomass for um, electric generation. There, there are two existing uh, plants that, that do that, um, but they um, uh, un, uh, that is not uh, as not to be an efficient use of, of biomass unless you use the waste heat, which uh, Burlington has been talking about for, uh, for a while. Uh, and and Rygate was considering, but nothing has has happened. And Rygate is not in a situation where a, a um, district heating system is is possible, given that it's in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> um, Representative Clifford, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just looking for an answer, and, and from anybody um, in the document, the S five document, on page four. Uh, written under <clears throat> definitions eight one two three, carbon intensity value is the amount of life cycle of greenhouse gas emissions per unit of energy of fuel expressed in grams of carbon dioxide equivalent to per mega megajoule megajoule megajoule. You don't know what that means. <laughs> I'm open. Sounds like a shark movie. Uh, intensity value. Um, <clears throat> Try to give a explanation or Ellen, you might be good at this by now. <laughs> sure. I mean, I think the first few words are the most important. It's the amount of life cycle greenhouse gas emissions per unit. So it's trying to standardize how we measure across a bunch of different fuel types the amount of carbon emissions. So it's going to be a unit of measurement, basically. And we talk about it later, and it's 80 to 20. So it's just a scale, it's a, it's a roundish number, um, but it's gonna be a unit of measurement of emissions across, and it can be used for different fuel types. And so that's why there's all those other extra words addressing the different units of measurement. It's like far dirtier. I just, okay, I just hope none of my constituents want me to go further on that. I'm gonna call you if they- <laughs> Well, I don't know if <laughs> Logan has more. <laughs> like we could give you an example. Okay. I personally could not provide an accurate one for you, but I could imagine one, which would be something like, um, so you, you uh, burn wood in a fireplace to heat your home. It's going to have a really high ratio of greenhouse gas emissions per unit of heat, right? Yeah. But if you burn a much cleaner source of energy, it's going to have a smaller percentage of greenhouse gas emissions emitted per unit of heat energy produced. Okay. So it's just more efficient versus less efficient heating fuels. And the life cycle piece is sort of like, so if you're thinking about um, natural gas that is obtained um, from like Texas or something, the life cycle would be from when they actually pull it out of the well and then they transfer it to uh, wherever they treat the gas and then they, the whatever is released through leaks as it comes through pipes. Um, and then finally, when it's, you know, gets to the Vermont home and it is burnt, that's the full life cycle, as opposed to, um, you know, if, uh, as opposed to just what is burnt in your house. So the cradle full life grave. cycles from the, yes, exactly. Cradle okay. to grave. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, and the other example that's in this bill, uh, later you establish sort of a baseline that uh, number two heating fuel has a carbon intensity of 100. So if any biofuels are blended into that, the carbon intensity will go down because there will be less carbon emissions 
because a cleaner source has been blended into that fuel. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and what's the biofuel that would be blended into it? There's a lot, and they do, uh, their carbon intensity values do vary widely. Um, they're not all created equal. Um, I think some of the, the ones that are considered the cleanest are, for example, used cooking oil, um, particularly because they're being reused and repurposed. Um, but there are different sources, so different um, plant uh, fuels, uh, fuel, uh, plant types that can be turned into fuels like corn or soy. Other questions? From milfoil. From mil oh, milfoil? Wow, okay. Maybe that's it. I've got a no, milfoil no. idea for the Representative Smith. I don't have it. No, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm going to think out loud for a second. I won't. That's wise. Yes. Oh, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Well, good morning for all of us. You. It was not you. It wasn't personal to you. No, that's okay. I do have a question. <laughs> Representative Smith. You, you mentioned <laughs> cooking oil and corn oil as a biofuel. If we start using more corn, people will be eating less corn. Uh, because you can only grow so much in this country. This is a very complicated topic that I'm yeah. not the exact expert on. However, there's a significant amount of subsidies on corn in this uh, country, and a significant amount is grown specifically for the production of biofuels. Oh, and interesting. So, yes. So there's already a fair amount of our corn crops go to the production of fuels. We could start and eating algae. There's a federal subsidy for that. <laughs> All right. Other thoughts on testimony that we've heard this week or questions that you have outstanding? Topics you would see us cover. Representative Corey, then Stebbins. Um, Logan. I thought that the changes suggested by the PUC seemed like ones we should talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. so. I think that we will um, ask Ellen to work those into the next draft. Great. Uh, Representative Stebbins, then Logan, then Zachary. Um, I would love to spend some time looking at the dates um, because that's been raised in a few different um, testimonies. And one of the ones um, that from the testimony we heard that I that particularly resonated with me was number 10 from Matt Coda, mm -hmm. which was uh january for the fuel dealers i don't know what they're doing oh yeah january if just, april if they're just registering i think it's easy enough to fill out a registration form no it was okay. doing it stuff. was having to be trued up and he was saying can we true up later yeah, yeah i i feel like those folks are really um they're they're answering no heat calls and i i think i'd like to look at the full data date list yeah Right. And Ellen, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the suggested PUC edits, but they also included some suggested timeline stuff. That, so you brought up the timeline to us um, and they also brought the timeline up to us. So I think we're hearing that we need to address timeline issues. So to the extent we can um, move forward on that, that would be great. Uh, you find the efficiency of Vermont? Yes, in our email. And, and is it posted, Kate? The efficiency yeah, of the last Great. Under this? Dave Westman. Dave Westman. So, that code has 10 points. It's still not seen. Yeah, just day March 30th. <clears throat> We just look under Dave Westman, really. Should be oh, I'm sorry. I would like to take some testimony on a potential study, mm -hmm. and specifically uh, Dave Westman um, in, on that from Efficiency Vermont. Uh, and I'm not sure, uh, perhaps. Um, Rich Cowart, also from the Regulatory Assistance Project, on those on an item. 
Okay, and Rich um, has maybe done them? I think in terms of, yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Dave Westman is subjected Westman. to them as well, or yes. and has done. Okay, great. Representative Clifford. And requested to hear from a couple of people. You should be on our Tuesday lineup. Okay. They should be on our Tuesday lineup. Thank you very much. Yeah, so folks who've requested or trying to accommodate them have a number of them in on Tuesday. So, the what? People who've requested to testify. Oh. Representative Tory. I was wondering if other people have any interest in kind of a higher level building <coughs> certification picture, maybe um, from a national organization. There's one I'm aware of called Rewiring America that could be useful for us just in terms of big picture of where we want to go as we're getting all in the weeds. I, I just wonder if it could be helpful for people to get a little bit of time. It could even just be a webinar or something that we watch on our own time. Um, something I feel like I'm missing right now that could be helpful. Um, I had an order, Logan and then Zadkowitz. Thanks. Um, the uh, <coughs> edits suggested by the Office of Racial Equity. Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, I wanted to be sure that I I've reviewed those and they look good. Yeah, yeah, they've got some. We should include those also. Yeah. Rep Representative Zadkowitz. Thanks. I have a few things I'd like to learn more about. Um, one is I'd like to know how the large amounts of um, recently approved federal money sort of intersects with the goals of, of this bill. Well, what will be the, if, if we were to have this, this bill go forward, what would be the what role would all this new money play? And mm -hmm. uh, how, how would it all kind of fit together? Um, and then Another question is um, to know how this bill um, affects either positively or negatively um, low-income folks who rent. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'd also like to know similarly um, how um, mobile home residents would be affected by this bill, either in a positive or negative way. And we, we were going to hear from the Capstones. Yes. We're trying to get some folks in who should help them. Those are my questions at the moment. Um, can I respond to one of the things? Yeah. So there, so the PUC in the in the Senate recommended strengthening the, the default delivery agent so that it was um have it, and I think in this mm -hmm. recommendation they did as well, so that more uh the, it was more default. And part of that being um having a central body who could specifically be drawing down the federal funds in this sector. Um, and they would have the PUC would have close eye on that budget process and um, the process they were using to and really working on drawing down those funds. So I think that there have been conversations that having the DDA be the central figure um, that's really sort of aggregating some of the different incentives to do this work and having sort of economies of scale that way is something they're envisioning with the default delivery agent and having them be the default so more work is going to go um, i think that was not my most eloquent answer but <laughs> yeah, no that was that was, that was good uh representatory yeah on the dpa in my mind it would be really effective if they were doing a lot of capacity building around workforce because we really heard that so loudly from fuel dealers now that they're not even well staffed up so i'm just wondering like is that is that in the vision for the dba yet or is it something that we would want to hear more about how work could be um, in capacity building for the transition i think we heard that from efficiency vermont yesterday um and they were uh, they were asking if we could kind of utilize this system, if you could get credits for workforce development and training. How that would get valued. Yeah. Yeah. How would it, could it be valued as us? Yeah. Okay. Recommendation three. So we oh, need to. We have that. 
Okay. We do, yeah. Under Dave Westman, the witness. <laughs> Representative Stebbin. Thanks. Um, for Representative Sakowitz's comment about uh, federal dollars, <clears throat> um, Joyce Manchester from JFO did give a presentation to Senate Natural Resources mm -hmm. um, that had a, you know, a, an overview of where some of the different dollars would be available, what was usable. So we just ask JFO to come in for 15 minutes or something on that. Um, but the other thing I just wanted to mention, the budget bill um, did have uh, money in it for, it was like $180,000 or so for sustainable, not sustainable jobs fund to mm -hmm. provide training to existing energy, energy service businesses to help them make a shift. And then there was also funding in there for other work for climate workforce mm -hmm. efforts. So I just want to highlight that there are initiatives underway. There are, and I keep going back to, I'd like to know who's keeping track of them all. And today with the, with TJ of the slide that we got from them, I wanted, I didn't get to ask because I had to leave, but it was that representative of the universe of funding or is, are there others? Do we know, how do we answer that question? I do think that, uh, so in the Senate, yes, I did hear from JFO, but I think they did also hear from DPS, who is keeping a close eye on all of the pots of money in this sphere. So you could also potentially hear from them. And I, I don't know if they'll be able to answer that question fully, but I do think they are. They're the one closest. Yeah. I, I was one. I mean, I don't know. Did you guys get and to ask that question it. to them today? They provided it. Yeah, yeah today. We got it today. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. in their presentation from yes. today. I just wasn't sure if I was trying to I was trying to limit like questions. So yes. I didn't ask a yes. question that I needed to be answered to. But that was only the list of federal funds. So that didn't include any state workforce development. Yeah. So um I you could put the ask out though and see if they could come back. Yeah. Yeah. Or on the state funds. Maybe JFO also would. JFO could give us the state and maybe DPS is federal. Representative Smith. Thank you. Do we know if the state of Vermont monies will be there when federal money runs out, once this is all, if, once, if and when it is all established, this bill, if the federal funding that's pushing it uh, is no longer there, are we going to have enough money to keep it going the way we want to keep it going? So that is one of the central themes of this bill is creating a marketplace that generates revenue to do this work. So that is the intent is to create a stable funding source. So this is where the extra dollars that uh, where fuels are going to cost more money, uh, additional taxes on fuels. Uh, is, is that going to be the funding? No. Behind it? So technically there will be there are no taxes and no taxes being raised in the fees, fees. And there aren't specifically any fees. Okay. It's it will be generated by the selling of the credits. Whatever price those are set at, that will generate the revenue. We won't know how much a credit is going to be until this bill is passed. Or, yeah, until well after this bill is passed, yes. Uh, Representative Morrison Bongards. Oh, thank you. <laughs> But that credit, he was going to talk it's a monetary value. <clears throat> Comes from somewhere, that monetary value. Yep. And it's going to be price per gallon or something similar. Yes, it probably will trickle down. But I do just want to make clear that this bill, this bill doesn't right. establish a funding source in the mechanism of a tax or a fee, but it's creating a market where things can be sold and bought to generate revenue. And yes, there potentially will, that will lead to costs on the price of fuel. And, and with that said, do, do we, and, I, and I've heard through a couple of the forums and you know, climate action meetings that one out of five dealers in Vermont just deliver home heating fuel as opposed to doing installations for alternatives. Mm -hmm. And we have, is, is there, there, we don't have an accurate number of actually how many that is and how many people they employ. I don't have that. <laughs> I'm sure they register now. In a map, yes, right. right. Yeah, uh, Matt Coda provided that information. I want to say 100. Uh, That's the number I heard. Can I ask another question? Please? After Representative Bongarts. All right. I can't. <laughs> so just sort of sitting here and talking, thinking about this, but I, 
know there's some work being done on workforce, developing workforce. I'm sitting here wondering whether whatever we're doing, we need to do times 10. Uh, or I have, I just, I don't know this, but I'm wondering, are we just kind of nibbling around the edges of that issue? Um, despite all the work that I know has been done by way, way of laying groundwork. <clears throat> and if, if the numbers that I've heard are correct, that we need another 6,000 people doing weatherization and really knowing, really getting trained to do installation for heat pumps, I don't know if that, I, I don't know what the right number is. And it may be unknowable actually, but I am wondering whether, you know, like, for instance, for those of you who have been around this longer than I have, do we believe this? No. Uh, you know, that, that we're going to hit those numbers for the um, heat pump forecast. Um, so I don't know. That's that's a fundamental question I'm sitting, I've been sitting here thinking about for the last couple of days is are we really um, doing what we really need to do to develop the workforce? And is that actually? Almost the most important thing you need to do. Um, yeah. Representative Sebelia, then so, Logan, was your question related to workforce? Right, along with what Chef, uh, Representative Bongard was just talking about. Yeah. Thank you. And I don't think we've done a lot of in depth discussion about this here in the committee yet about the potential study, but who was it yesterday? It was Dave Westman started talking about the potential study and how you would, um, how you would, um, do that. And, and what that does is it helps us set. Uh, so we've got our goals and statute, and then we're looking at, okay, now what is possible based on, um, I think he said, you know, you measure what needs to be done, then you measure um, if everything's free, how many, what would be the percentage of people that would participate, which still wouldn't be a hundred percent, then take it another level. What do we have for work? What are the limiting factors? What's the workforce situation? What are supply chain issues? What's happening with fuel prices? Um, all of those things. And then we end up with something that looks more likely that is achievable, reasonable. I, I would like to add to what- So it helps, us, it helps us to adjust to the workforce that we have while we're building workforce. And look, while, while Representative Sevilla is talking about the potential study, I would- can you just help us understand how you see the potential study informing S5 and how it goes forward? How would it get worked in? So it's, it is in here right now. Um, I'm not sure what section it's in here. Um, and it's pretty small. What we need to do, I believe, is put some parameters around it. Um, there's been a, uh, there, a potential study is not a new concept. Um, the regulatory assistance project, for instance, has done some taking of. Um, was successful and less successful. Group. Yeah, where's uh, it's on page 18. 81 coming on on page 29. That, would that be yeah. it? No, on 18. 18. So, right now, this has the Department of Public Service um, conducting this, um, this potential study looking at what's possible. Um, so, we need to give them a little bit more um, information about what factors we'd like them to consider. And that's why I've asked for folks who have either been subjected to potential studies or who have had to critique them or... Uh, uh, so am I answering your question, Madam Chair? Well, I'm wondering how, what, um, what, what you're kind of interested in, would be, how would you need to augment it? What's like, what's not here that we need or and or like I have a note here said needs a deadline. So that's another thing we need to work into the timeline. I think that was from you walking us through it. So um, at what, a minute. what else does the potential study, if we want to kind of integrate it into informing this you know, creation of this program, what else do we need to do? Well, we may want to give the administration um, clear parameters about what we want them to consider when they're assessing what the potential is. So things uh, and, and what we don't necessarily want them to consider when they're uh, assessing what the parameters are. Time, timeline, et cetera. Kate, why is this phone a friend? Okay, I was just looking to see. All right, Representative Smith has been patient. Thank you. It's kind of like what Representative Bonkers was saying, it's kind of like building a house. You buy all the materials and you can't find anybody to build it. 
So is it, does it make any sense to even pursue S5 before we know if, if we get the, the workforce to, to, it, to make it work? If you don't have the workforce, S5 can sit, on a, can sit right up on that wall forever. Potential study will scale. Right? Yeah, Representative scale. Logan. Sorry. And then Pat. Well, I'd say, and I'm concerned with the workforce considerations too, but if there isn't a market for something, then there's no point in having a workforce. You need both. You need to do both. You need to be prepare for the market by preparing a workforce, and then the workforce will naturally grow, and it'll, it'll scale up naturally as word gets out about this new profession and people become more accustomed to it. But, um, but you do have to like, you know, give it a little kick and certain, yeah, um, a little certainty by setting the market conditions. And so along those lines, um, the, I have, I'm looking at this, the recommendations from Efficiency Vermont, the recommendation number three to support all market activities that result in clean heat measures. This is an interesting place to put this into the bill in section 8127 on credit ownership. Um, they recommend adding a clause to 8127B credit ownership. Um, in the page 20. 20 thank you. Um, Oh, so, tradable under section 8127, tradable clean heat credits, section subsection B, credit ownership, the commission in consultation with the tech tag shall establish a standard methodology for determining what party or parties shall be the initial owner, and they strike initial the owner of a clean heat credit upon its creation, comma, including a representative value for the provision of all components of current and future programs to include but not be limited to financial incentives, workforce development, market uplift, and training. So in other words, considering the fact that installation or delivery of uh, a clean heat measure also requires all of these other pieces, the financial incentives, the workforce development, market uplift, and training. But I, for the life of me, cannot understand how <laughs> this would work. I can't imagine it. And I feel like I need somebody to explain it to me, but then that would be the purpose of the tag. The tag would need to figure out how to include those components. And there's three too, like you heard. Right. How, how does that? Yeah, but I, I think it's smart because like you said, it would it basically provides a, a, a way for funding the conditions that will create a successful market. Representative Pat. Um, getting, getting back to what we were talking about, you know, sort of the obstacles like whether or not, whether or not uh, there's going to be workforce or those, those kind of questions. I think the, the bill as the Senate passed does uh, put a, basically a, 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 this, this will not in any event be implemented until at least two years uh, from now after the study is done. And I think we should be able, we can add language around the study that I think uh, beyond what it says now that specifies that we, we want analysis of the, you know, whether, whether uh, it's realistic and what time frame, including, uh, you know, issues such as uh, is, is there sufficient workforce and stuff like that, that should be part of the uh, study. The study may say, um, uh, uh, it, it, you know, it, it will take uh, some time before the workforce uh, uh, develops sufficient to be fully functioning and what, what you want to do or may not. I don't, you know, I don't know, but that should be one of the things that, that we have for uh, in the analysis, as well as any, any other kind of uh, uh, obstacles. It will, it, it will, it will uh, um, uh, it already says that, that it's necessary that they 
uh, give the uh, the cost impact uh, of it. And that would what, you know what uh, what this might or might not do to uh, uh, the cost of a gallon of, uh, of fuel. Representative Devins. So uh, from this morning's presentation, um, you know this chart here where it went. 23, 24, 25, 26, half, 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 10 minutes, five, I mean, I interpret this as these are all of the ARPA dollars mm -hmm. and, you know, the IRA dollars. This is what we've been doing. And then there's this stop. And so, you know, when I was listening to their testimony and, and there was the statement of like the gap, that to me is sort of going to your point, we're, we're building up workforce in 23, 24, 25, 26, and then there's this drop without federal input. And that's where I sort of see this market approach helping to keep that go. Filling going. In, under filling in the difference. Yeah. Sure. That's actually great. Um, yeah. And I, so the 6,000 number, um, sure. Workers that, that we were told we would need to do this work, and I guess I think like, does that mean if we were going to do it all today, we would need six thousand, or is there a is again is there a a time frame put to that? Yeah, representative. Right. So, so uh, what Secretary Moore has presented to us um, and is being widely from, yeah. widely shared is um, looking at the goals that we have in the Global Warming Solutions Act, the 2030 goal, and what it would take for us to hit the 2030 goal in for emissions reductions. So what are the measures? How many people will we need? And then she's transferred the cost. I think that's where the 6,000 came in. It is, yes, it is. And so, Madam Chair, you asked before about how does this potential study help mm -hmm. us? This potential study says, okay, now let's look at what's okay. actually possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I like to be really clear that, you know, when we look at what's actually possible, uh, we will know that that sense is not correct. We may still not know what is correct, but that 70 cents presumes that we're doing all of these measures, that we can do all of these measures by 2030. The potential study will help us understand what, in fact, we can do. As we're, and, and as resources are changing, as our workforce is building, that will increase. As our supply chains loosen up, that will increase. So I think that 6,000, it, it's good for us to understand. But also, I think this, we... We have mechanisms to help us scale to what is possible. And we were reminded today that the Global Warming Solutions Act is not at any cost. That's Re right. Right. That's right. It has to be reasonable and doable. That's right. Does it, does it make sense to, am I the only one that thinks I need to know what a credit is worth before we pass a bill? You will. You won't know how much a credit is worth until after the bill is yeah. well after the market. But also the market. It's, it's yeah. going to keep changing. Yes. But well, do you change. know how much a renewable energy credit is worth? I don't even know how much room you need to put a cubic ton of carbon. How much yeah. is your heating oil going to be in three years? It could go down if we start drilling. It might go up. It could go up. It could go in any direction. There's a lot of this, yeah, that we that's volatile and unpredictable um, that we live with today. It's built into the default because people need to heat their houses. Representative Logan. Um, just going back to the Efficiency Vermont recommended edits, um, they have other recommendations that are around timelines. And then um, for uh, the to allow the potential study to temporarily modify the compliance obligation and change uh, the period for any adjustments based on the potential study to be up to 36 months rather than 18 months. That piece we heard from the PUC, that increase from 18 to yeah. 30. We heard from oh, both of them. I yes. think they agreed. Yeah, they did agree. 
and also to take market conditions into consideration and also to include the quantity of credits generated in the, the triannual um, proceedings where they set credit costs and and the quantity of credits to be generated. Anyway, all of their recommendations seem sound. Right. Representative Sebelia. Madam Chair, if we're still talking about testimony, um, I think some, uh, I think Representative Stebbins talked about the dates. Um, I think it would be good for us to have another kind of walkthrough with um, Budget Council on the dates. It would also be helpful just to understand um, as part of those dates, the orders and just the different actions the PUC is taking as a part of that. Add into the timeline. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Representative Tor. Last thing. Um, this rewiring America idea that I had. Um, I'm going to see if there is a specific workforce. He's still up. That'd be great. Maybe that could be but the other thought I had was something that was mentioned by um, DPS today about public engagement. Yeah, and and, the, and their concerns around that, and I kind of wanted to. I think there was an allusion to the PUC kind of, kind of mixed bag on public engagement. So maybe that's another area that we could get some um, insight into. Um, I don't know if anyone else is curious about that. Yeah, we've been that? getting public engagement, <laughs> but that's not productive. Abelia and then seven. But how they get. Yeah, I mean, I would say we have been getting a lot of public engagement. There's been a number of elections that have occurred since the Global Warming Solutions Act also, which is this is in response to. Um, but in uh, it was H715, we did have other public engage engagement measures in there that were pretty. Uh, oh, in last year's version. They were pretty well. Yeah, this year's version is different. So, yes. Right. Well, I represented. But I would say that the DP, so we heard from, so uh, Secretary Moore and the department are both engaging right now in very robust processes, and they will be over the next year, which presumably is going to feed into this work. So, I mean, I think Vermont is having an extremely healthy discussion, extremely Engaged. intense. Engaged. Engaged. Oh, Engaged. Oh, you. Well, you. That's the right word. <laughs> Yeah, clean heat discussion about clean heated, uh, clean heated discussion. That's the part. Uh, it does come up. It, it, it does come up. I so. well, the public process. Yes, the yeah. public process. There were questions about the PUC process being different people having different experiences with how accessible they find it. Representative Stebbins and then Logan. Um, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, so we also heard this morning that um, Public Service Department or ANR, uh, the analysis is there's going to be a draft in April, May, ish, um, and they will be done in June. Um, and then the Department of Public Service is doing this sort of large public process for the the next comprehensive energy plan. And I guess I, I, I just see those as um, what you were saying, Representative Sebelia, I see them more as, I see those as complementary. And I guess uh, really hearing that people said, um, don't make this more challenging mm -hmm. uh, or more complex, hearing that one of the things that maybe if we go through another walkthrough at some point, um, does there need to be more direction to take some of the feedback from the comprehensive energy plan public process? Mm -hmm. And, you know, how, how do we, because it also doesn't make sense to do multiple public processes. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many times does the public want to come out to hear about Vermont's energy policy? Like, it makes sense to leverage that, in my mind, with this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's my question is, is that 
Um, those were the recommendations from the Office of Racial Equity is that they hire a facilitator for the public outreach for S5. Is that the process that will be used for the consolidated energy plan public engagement process? Because that, that I think that's where it would get tricky. Like we're going to improve language in the bill based on the Office of Racial Equities recommendations on how to conduct the outreach more effectively and then in a more inclusive way and then but that wouldn't impact the well there was might be outreach in this process here I think yeah and my I mean I feel like in the past and I don't know if this is how the public service department is doing it this round but in the past um, for comprehensive energy plans or for different types of efforts like that you know, they've, they've set up like six meetings throughout the state and they'll go to like St. Johnsbury or the Brattleboro. Um, and I mean, I, I could imagine there could be some way to balance the two and work them together mm -hmm. while not also asking everyone that's already been tasked 18 times to 18 different committees in the um, yeah. racial justice group to... Definitely, definitely heard that feedback. Mm -hmm. Representative. Yeah, I just want to be clear because I was not, I was saying, so a &R is running an analysis. They're not running the public process. And then uh, the department, the department is running. that's running the public process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I thought I missed something. Um, did you have one more? Hand up? I, I guess I'll. Uh, may I? You may. Thank you. Uh, uh, Representative Logan was just talking about racial equity. Can, I don't mean to sound unknowledgeable of this, but what does that have to do with a clean heat standard? I, I don't know. And, and I, 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 I've been wanting to ask that question for quite a while. Sure. Um, well, I mean, we could take further testimony if you really want to get into the nitty gritty. But if you look back at the Energy Action Network's presentation, I believe, um, they do a demographic analysis and 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 demonstrate that there are differ, different social and economic groups that have a higher energy burden, meaning that they pay more of a percentage per dollar of their household income for heating Why? their home. Why? It's a great question. Uh, there is not a short answer. Um, and that, that's why people use the term historically marginalized, that groups who have been um, treated differently socially and economically in the past continue to have lingering economic um, uh, differences between, say, like white middle class folks have more wealth than black middle class folks in the United States on average. Same thing with lower income white folks have an average of $109,000 of wealth in their household, whereas lower income black folks in America have negative $9,000 of wealth in their household. So there's just lingering impacts so that- And that's probably a tough thing to figure out in Vermont. I think, and I'm guessing on the percentages, 3% uh, uh, African-American families in Vermont and 4% or 5% uh, Latino. So. It, and they all, 90% of them concentrate on a, on a city somewhere to live. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons we have an Office of Racial Equity is to help provide the data that helps us understand inequity in Vermont. And so they're super, they're a super helpful resource in terms of, you know, facts, okay. data. All right. That's enlightened me. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, members. Um, thank you for this discussion. I... Um, I think where we're going to head from here is to ask Ellen to integrate the suggest some of many of the suggested changes that we've heard. Um, I also recommend that you all revisit them, and you know when we walk do the walkthrough, make sure you're tracking the ones you're interested in. And um, so, at Wednesday of next week, I think we'll be looking at another draft of this. And um, always feel free to send us ideas for. Witnesses you want to hear from, and Laura has obviously been integral to helping move this and make sure we're hearing from the people. So, send it to both of us. And 
that's that. I think this was a great week. Thanks. It was so long.